So hello and welcome to part two of our med surge quick review. If you haven't checked out part one, I have that video uploaded, but this is going to be part two of three for our NCLEX med surge prep. In this review, we're going to start to tackle body systems. We're going to start with urinary and renal nursing. We're going to start with cardiac nursing, respiratory nursing, GI and nutrition, and then end up with endocrine nursing for part two of our review. Again, I'm not affiliated with um, ATI or with the NCLEX um, exam in any way, shape or form. I took my NCLEX back in May of 2023. And essentially, this is a compilation of all of the notes that I took while I was studying from lots and lots of uh, really awesome resources. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, this is our NCLEX prep review. So we are going to get into the nitty gritty of um, these topics. I'm not going to teach or um, explain um, per se content. If you need a refresher on specific body systems you're a little bit unfamiliar with, I have plenty of videos in a playlist um, on the YouTube channel um, for everyone to go ahead and check out. Really what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the nursing process. We're gonna focus on our assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started with the urinary system. So what are our functions of the urinary system? Main function is going to be a route for excretion, okay? Usually we want our patients to have good urinary output greater than 30 mLs an hour, but it does kind of differ based on body weight, okay? Naturally, heavier individuals should produce more output than smaller individuals. Okay. A couple tests um, involving the urinary system. A lot of it's going to be a urinalysis. It's important to know how to check a urinalysis. Ideally, we're going to get the first morning void and we're going to use the clean catch technique. That is where they use a wipe to clean the area. They start their stream. About halfway through the stream, they're going to place the cup under and collect that in a sterile container. You can't pull from a pure wick, anything like that. If your patient is unable to avoid, you can get a urinalysis from a straight cap. Radiography, um, this can kind of help us get a visual picture of what's going on with the urinary system, but it's very important that we check the creatinine beforehand because this is very harsh on the kidneys, okay? Anytime we undergo any sort of procedures involving contrast dyes, um, it can be very, very harsh on the kidneys or whatever they might use in radiology. So following up with fluid boluses is very important. What are some common procedures that we're gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about our renal angiography, uh, cystoscopy and a renal biopsy. It's important to know before that angio that the patient voids before and that they're going to go ahead and keep that extremity straight. What is our cystoscopy? Um, we're gonna go ahead, place the patient in the lithotomy position. After a cystoscopy, pink tinge urine is expected. However, any sort of red, bright red, bloody urine full of clots, we're gonna want to um, report to the provider and we focus on pain management. Renal biopsies, that's where we're gonna, they're going to go ahead and take a biopsy of the kidney. It's very important that afterwards, um, let's say they went and got the left side, you're going to have that patient lay on that affected side so that they can keep pressure on that area because um, bleeds to that area can very quickly progress into a um, hypovolemic shock quite quickly. Kidneys can bleed a lot. Any sort of trauma to the kidney, that's kind of where we're, you know, filtering blood, big, big blood supply. And that's going to be a priority finding. Any sort of hypotension post-renal biopsy, that's going to absolutely be a priority finding. Okay. We're going to keep them laying flat um, for 24 hours after. What are some surgical procedures? First is going to be our kidney transplant. These are done for patients with um, chronic kidney disease, usually end-stage renal disease. Um, or a patient maybe had a traumatic loss of their kidney. 
very important that we verify match status and we make sure the patient gets dialysis before surgery. After surgery, the patient's going to require lifelong immunosuppressant, so it's important to provide that education of um, really avoiding those large crowds, fully cooking your food, um, staying up to date on vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. We're also going to monitor for signs and symptoms of rejection. Patient would have a lot of pain, swelling, warmth, redness in that area. Um, you'll start to see, you know, all those symptoms they had before when they were in end-stage renal disease, where they have a really high BUN and creatinine, poor, poor urinary output. You also see an increase in white blood cell count. Um, what is a urinary diversion? Um, very important that we monitor vital signs and the site afterwards. Um, where can the site be? It really just depends um, where the provider put it, but it's going to result in nephrostomy tubes. Essentially, the um, tubes are providing a direct access point to the kidneys so that the kidneys can drain appropriately, whether it's left, right, or both. Um, we can irrigate the tubing, um, but we can never clamp the tubing, okay? It's also important that we use aseptic technique when dealing with this. Our TERP procedure, this is used for patients with BPH. Essentially, they are going to resect the prostate. This will result in post-op needing continuous bladder irrigation to help flush out those clots. Again, pinkish tinged urine is normal. Bright red blood clotty is not, okay? Pain relief and antispasmodics are going to be key. And we're going to absolutely increase fluids. We must monitor for TERP syndrome. This can happen post TERP. Patient can have um, hyponatremia, um, usually hypotension, bradycardia, and some altered mental status. First thing we're gonna talk about is chronic kidney disease. Just be aware that it's staged based on the decline in kidney function. Um, in essentially the glomerular filtration rate. Once a patient hits end-stage renal disease, that's really where that GFR is between 15 to 29. Um, that's like our stage four, and then less than 15 is end-stage, going to require dialysis or kidney transplant. What puts someone at risk for CKD? Usually it's going to be a lot of both a mix of modifiable versus non-modifiable risk factors. Patients will present with hypocalcemia, anemia, fatigue, and essentially almost everything but the calcium is going to be increased. So hypernatremia, increased BUN, creatinine. What's our nursing intervention for a patient with CKD? We're going to essentially restrict anything that can build up. With CKD, everything builds because they can't excrete. They can't properly filter because the kidney function is very, very poor. So these patients are also going to need to be on strict uh, intake and output. We need to monitor what goes in versus what comes out. What can we do for patients? Um, we can do dialysis. So what does dialysis do? It's going to help remove waste and urea. We've got three different focuses. We've got peritoneal dialysis, um, continuous peritoneal dialysis, and hemodialysis. So what is peritoneal dialysis? It is dialysis through a catheter made into the abdomen. It uses sugar, essentially like a sugar water solution to help pull fluid and electrolytes out. So with peritoneal dialysis, it's important we have the patient void before and we get their dry weight and then we sit them up. Very important we use strict aseptic technique and this fluid essentially flows to gravity. We also want to, um, after dwell time, when it's time to empty, sometimes fluid can get stuck in the abdomen, have them move around, okay? Why is it important we get their weight after? We want to make sure that their weight has um, decreased after peritoneal dialysis, okay? Continuous ambulatory um, peritoneal dialysis, this is going kind of 24-7, so they're at a higher risk for bowel or bladder perforation. So it's important that you monitor the um, output. What color is it? Okay. Big, big complication is peritonitis, where the patient can have a rigid board-like abdomen, cloudy output. That is a priority finding. Essentially, there was a breach in a septic technique. Um, which put the patient at risk for uh, infection. And the issue with peritonitis is it can absolutely put a patient into sepsis, um, thus resulting in septic shock. And then last but not least, we have hemodialysis. So what is uh, going on with our hemodialysis? 
we are essentially filtering via the blood. Okay, it's very important that we weigh the patient before and after the procedure. We're monitoring their blood pressure. We're avoiding any sort of drastic changes uh, in the blood pressure. Naturally, dialysis will lower the BP, but we're not trying to lower it from 180 to 90. Okay, very, very dangerous. Um, in the site in which they have a hemodialysis port, um, what is a hemodialysis port? Essentially, it is a surgical intervention that has sewn together a uh, artery and a vein, like a graft, so we can pull and put back. Um, sometimes patients can get dialysis through um, a um, pick line or any other um, non-permanent line, um, but the dialysis catheter involves, sorry, the hemodialysis catheter involves a surgical procedure. So if someone has a hemodialysis catheter, usually it's kind of in the arm. So wherever that site is, we're going to assess for a thrill and a brewy. A thrill, you'll feel kind of like a vibration, and then you'll hear the brewy on auscultation. If you are unable to feel or hear anything, that is a priority finding because we can really no longer use that um, site. So the patient's probably going to need a temporary um, dialysis um, port, okay? Um, avoid giving certain medications beforehand. This is going to pretty much include blood pressure medications and antibiotics or any pertinent medication the patient needs like a um, thyroid medication because what happens is the patient is going to get all of that blood pulled out and filtered. And if it's pulled out and it's filtered, they are no longer um, going to have that available in blood. Okay. Um, couple complications, disequilibrium syndrome can happen. Sometimes they might need to slow down the dialysis or maybe not pull as much out. The patient will experience cramping and flushing. We're going to also watch for steel syndrome. They will have lots of pain, numbness, tingling, and decreased pulses in the side in which they have their HD port. Okay, wherever, if it's in the right arm, the official is in the right arm, they're going to have that kind of um, assessment findings in that right arm. After hemodialysis, it might take a little bit of time to maintain hemostasis. So we're going to cover the fistula with a dressing and make sure that, you know, hemostasis has occurred, meaning bleeding has stopped from the port or the fistula, whichever we're, we're using. Okay. Big focus of our urinary renal system is going to be on uh, chronic kidney disease. Okay. Up next, we have our um, cardiac system. So I just included some normal values just that you guys are aware. Um, kind of understand big picture. Yes, it's important to know a general idea of what, what the normal lab values are for these, but it's more so the why. So yes, we know a map is 60 to 100, but what does that mean? It's perfusion. So even if my patient's blood pressure is low, if my map is like 75, 80, it means that their, their organs are getting blood, they're being perfused well, so we're not starving the organs of oxygen or anything like that, okay? Um, pulse pressure can just kind of um, indicate what might be happening. What are our H's and T's going on with our patient? What, what's going on with them? So a low pulse pressure usually will indicate some sort of hypovolemia or heart failure, whereas a high widened pulse pressure, this is more indicative of patient with acute cardiac issues such as, you know, heart attack, coronary artery disease. Okay. BNP is what we use to help uh, measure heart failure. Um, we want a BNP to be less than 100. You will have some patients where their BNP is in the 7,000s or the 14,000s. That is um, heart failure, and we're going to need to get an echocardiogram done on that patient to show what is the ejection fraction. So that's BNP. BNP tells us, you know, how, how well is the heart pumping? How well does the heart function? Um, CVP, we want to be less than eight. Um, anything greater than that is going to possibly indicate cardiac tamponade. We're going to talk about our assessment findings in a little while. And then anytime your patient has a chest tube in place, we want to make sure that the drainage is less than 100 mLs an hour. Okay. Whenever we're auscultating a patient, um, always auscultate at the apical pulse. 
what are some common procedures versus going to be a cardiac cath. It's important to know what are pre-op and post-op considerations. Pre-op, the patient must be NPO six hours before the procedure. For the procedure, we're assessing for allergies, not only to the contrast dye, but to shellfish. If the patient is currently on metformin for diabetes, we're going to hold that before the procedure because the cardiac cath involves that contrast dye which is harsh on the kidneys and metformin is also very, very harsh on the kidneys. So we don't want to put the patient into an acute kidney injury, okay? After cardiac cath, we're going to perform a neurovascular assessment every 15 minutes and check blood pressure. We wanna check for any uh, drops in blood pressure. Um, but we also want to make sure their blood pressure isn't increasing because if that blood pressure gets too high, they might have some bleeding or complications um, occur at the site. What are we doing with the neurovascular assessment? Remember, patients for cardiac cath will either go through the radial or the femoral artery. We're assessing it, making sure that the patient has pulses distal to the insertion site, that there's no pallor, there's no paresthesias, there's no blue, there's no absent pulses, anything like that, okay? Afterwards, patient will be on strict bed rest for six hours and they must keep that extremity straight. Okay. Usually the bed rest is more if they go in the femorals because that's, you know, um, how you keep the extremity straight. If you're up walking, anything like that, you're, you're bending the extremity. Up next is a TEE. Um, this helps us. This is like a uh, echocardiogram, um, but it kind of goes uh, through the throat. That's why the patient needs to be NPO six to eight hours beforehand. It's going to help us assess our patient's ejection fraction. After the test, we want to do a respiratory assessment, make sure gag reflex is intact, no difficulty swallowing, anything of the sorts. Um, blood tinge um, secretions are normal, but we do want to report any excessive bleeding. A cabbage is essentially a, um, if a cardiac cath is unsuccessful or they're unable to fix a blockage with the cardiac cath, they're going to have to open up the patient. Um, this involves the patient being intubated and sedated uh, for the procedure where during cardiac cath, they're awake and they're not intubated. Okay, afterwards, patient will have a chest tube place. Again, report excessive draining. Um, afterwards, we want to perform a full post-op assessment. Okay, and then finally, we have a central venous catheter. This can be used for long-term therapies. It must be placed. Um, via radiology, our professional nurses are unable to place a central venous catheter. Um, a big complication of these is an air emboli. Um, if the patient has an air emboli, they will start to have some uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, confusion, and you might see some ST depression. Um, as, so therefore, we're going to want to go ahead and put that patient in Trendelenburg. Now we're going to get into our CPR portion and our rhythms uh, portion. I have a full video going in depth on how to interpret EKGs. So that's available for you guys. I won't be teaching you right now how to interpret EKGs. Essentially, we're gonna be going over what's the rhythm, what do we do about it, okay? Um, so first of all, we need to know our basic CPR. We're gonna do uh, 911, get an AED, call EMS. Um, very important that we start early CPR please make sure you review your rate and rhythms. Um, we're also going to provide ventilations to the patient. If there's any sort of cervical or spinal trauma suspected, um, we're going to use the jaw thrust instead of the head tilt chin lift. So we've got three different uh, things that kind of involve electricity, kind of helping out the, the cardiac system. First is going to be cardioversion. This is done on awake, stable patients um, where they have like an unstable um, pulse rate and an unstable rhythm, but they still have a pulse. It's just not a stable pulse. Um, it might be like, um, a patient that's in symptomatic SVT, where their pulse rate is way beyond normal limits. The rhythm is unstable, but they still have a pulse. They're still breathing. Okay. Cardioversion is done on a patient with a pulse. It's just abnormal. Okay. What does cardioversion do? It provides a synchronized shock to kind of help the um, heart kind of restart and, and recuperate and figure things out. Um, this can hurt, so the patient should be sedated or given pain medication prior. 
Defibrillation, on the other hand, this is done on a patient without a pulse, meaning pulses V-fib or V-tap, okay? D-fib, think dead, okay? This is going to shock essentially all of the energy out of the heart, um, so the heart can kind of figure itself out again, okay? Obviously, it's going to use a lot more energy um, than cardioversion. It's very important with cardioversion because the patient does have a um, rhythm going on that we make sure that it is synchronized to the patient. So we're not shocking on, on, an, on like the T wave or anything like that. And then finally, we have a pacemaker. Pacemakers are um, usually placed in those patients with those really low ejection fractions um, or any sort of cardiac anomaly. It's very important that if a patient does have a pacemaker, we avoid an MRI. If the patient needs an MRI, the machine itself will need to be interrogated. Post pacemaker insertion, we're gonna keep um, like whatever side, if it's on the left or the right, we're gonna keep that arm in a sling and not raise it after the procedure. Um, please, please, please report hiccups to your provider. This can indicate that it is not placed appropriately. We're also gonna teach the patient to check their pulse rate daily. So what are our need to know rhythms? Up first is going to be AFib. The heart rate's usually elevated with AFib. How do we treat AFib? If it's unstable AFib, meaning the patient's heart rate is um, very elevated, it's maybe greater than 160, 180, but the patient is symptomatic, they're short of breath, they're anxious, they're feeling uncomfortable, we're gonna do cardioversion. If the patient's stable, meaning they have AFib, but they're, you know, asymptomatic and their heart rates maybe kind of jump in 90s to 100s. Um, we're going to put them on maybe an antiarrhythmic such as cardizim or amiodarone. And then patient that has chronic AFib or new diagnosed AFib, we're going to want to start them on anticoagulants and warfarin because AFib puts patient at high risk for clots. Someone at high risk for clots is at increased risk for stroke or um, cardiovascular accidents. PVCs, they're always going to be low priority. Um, only time that they're going to be high priority is when the patient is in VTAC, where they start to have a run of PVCs. So if you notice your patient has been thrown an occasional PVC, we're just going to monitor frequency um, because the more frequent they are, it's going to result in less perfusion because a PVC is a non-perfusing beat. Okay. Some things that can cause PVCs Heart failure, any sort of myocardial infarction, usually our fluid electrolyte imbalances. What can we do for a patient with PVCs? We can give them some amiodarone or maybe some um, Satellol. Up next is torsades. It has a very distinct um, rhythm on the monitor. This is caused by hypomagnesia. What are we gonna do for torsades? Your patient won't have a pulse, so we're going to absolutely initiate CPR, um, kind of do our CPR protocol, and then magnesium. It's caused by hypomagnesemia. We give magnesium, okay? Heart blocks. These patients have an abnormally long P to R interval. If it's um, essentially prolonged um, too much, it's going to thus result in a lower heart rate. So patients usually require pacemaker if their heart block is severe. Sinus tachycardia. This is normal sinus rhythm with an elevated heart rate. We're going to want to treat the underlying cause. If the patient is symptomatic and their heart rate is in the 200s and they're having a hard time catching their breath, we are going to push adenosine. The issue with adenosine, it will cause a brief period of asystole. So we're going to want to make sure that we have pads at bedside, resuscitation equipment at bedside. Um, with our adenosine, we always must blush with a 20 cc uh, normal saline, okay? Sinus Brady, on the other hand, this is a low heart rate, heart rate less than 60. If the patient is symptomatic, we can treat with a medication atropine or transcutaneous pacing if symptomatic. Usually if the patient doesn't feel dizzy, nauseous, short of breath, anything, we give them atropine. But if they're really struggling, you know, they're exhibiting those signs and symptoms of poor perfusion, we're going to want to initiate transcutaneous pacing. This might require a permanent pacemaker. VTAC is a run of PVCs. First thing you want to do uh, for VTAC is assess for a pulse. If they have no pulse, they're not breathing, we're going to initiate a CPR with early defibrillation is going to be key. If they do have a pulse, though, we're going to want to cardiovert. This is an unstable rhythm, so we are going to ride the lightning. We are going to cardiovert the patient. Um, can also give amiodarone or lidocaine. 
V-fib, we defib as soon as possible, and then we provide CPR. Both your V-fib and your VTAC are shockable rhythm, so delivering a shock is going to be our initial priority, okay? Um, usually, causative agents of V-fib is going to be myocardial infarction, so afterwards, these patients usually end up going straight to the cath lab. Asystole, on the other hand, this is your flat line, no pulse, no rhythm. We must initiate CPR first, try to get us a shockable rhythm. Um, once you do have a shockable rhythm, defibrillate. In the meantime, medications we can give to help establish a rhythm, maybe get the patient a little blood pressure going on, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and vasopressor. Essentially, if you have enough epinephrine, you can probably give the wall a blood pressure. But the reason we give these medications is we really want to try to help us get the patient maybe into VTAC or VFib where we can then deliver a shock. We can get all that out and then the heart can, can restart again. You can get ROS, return of spontaneous circulation. Alrighty, up next we have our cardiac disorders. So most common is going to be angina, which is chest pain. We've got stable versus unstable. Stable is relieved with rust and nitro. Um, unstable is unrelieved, okay? Usually these patients will have some EKG changes, um, which we'll talk about, and chest pain. Um, what medications can we give for this? We can give nitrates, our cardiac, ABCDs, um, possible cardiac cath is usually what's, what's going to occur. How do we determine if it's chest pain versus myocardial infarction? We look at the EKG. So the patient can have a STEMI or a non-STEMI, either the ST segment of the EKG is elevated or it's not. Usually STEMIs require immediate intervention and STEMIs, we can usually put the patient on a heparin or nitro drip and see how they do with that and then maybe do a, a heart cath later, okay? What do we do for patients with myocardial infarction? We're going to want to give them oxygen um, and then our, our nitrates, okay, nitroglycerin. We always hold nitro if the patient is hypotensive or if the patient has used any sort of erectile dysfunction medication. We'll talk more about these medications in the pharmacology review. Um, so there we go. Up next, we have heart failure. Um, is it left-sided heart failure versus right-sided? If you think left, think lungs. These patients will present with a lot of a respiratory symptoms, such as shortness of breath, frothy sputum, or thopnea. Right-sided heart failure, on the other hand, the right side of the heart is having an issue with pumping somewhere, whether it's, you know, our, our valves or whatever we got going on, valves, ventricles. These patients will have sy systemic symptoms. So you'll see more of that dependent edema, GI issues, jugular vein distension. Patients with heart failure have that elevated BNP, um, almost always present with fluid volume overload, FVO. What is our treatment for heart failure? Obviously fluid and salt restrictions. We're gonna give them um, the gold standard is making sure that the patient is on an ACE, ARB, or ARNI and that they get an echo so we can see have they improved, have they declined, et cetera. Okay. And then um, uh, some Dijoxin, okay. Um, always make sure that the airway is, is patent and these patients are able to breathe appropriately. Sitting them up helps. Um, what can we do if we're having a hard time hearing their lung sounds? That's a normal finding, okay? They have fluid overload. Um, in this situation, absolutely diuretics are going to be the best thing we can do, help get some of that fluid off. Remember, nebulizers aren't going to help. They're having difficulty breathing because of fluid volume overload, not because of any other, other issue, okay? Please, please, please stress smoking cessation. Um, Varencycline and nicotine replacement therapy can help um, a patient who's kind of on, on their, their road to, to quitting smoking. Up next, we have valve disorders. Is it stenosis or is it regurgitation? Stenosis occurs when blood flow is impeded. When we have our aortic valve stenosis, we will hear a systolic murmur at the second intercostal space right of the sternal border. If we have mitral valve stenosis, we're going to hear a diastolic murmur at the PMI. Once our treatment for stenosis, usually it's going to be a mechanical valve replacement. If we got a mechanical valve replacement, the patient will be on anticoagulants for life. If we use a biological valve replacement, that's okay. Um, they won't last as long. Um, but we have to make sure that before any sort of uh, procedures, especially dental procedures, that we give prophylactic antibiotics beforehand. 
regurgitation, this is a backwards leakage of blood from the valves. When we have aortic valve regurgitation, we will hear a diastolic murmur at the third intercostal, intercostal space left of the sternal border. With mitral valve regurgitation, we will hear a systolic murmur at the PMI, okay? Risk factors for regurgitation include endocarditis and rheumatic fever. Now we have PAD versus PVD, peripheral artery disease. That is when blood can no longer get down, okay? Patient will experience intermittent claudication. When they do, have them walk till they feel pain, stop and keep going. They'll have shiny skin, ulcers, and diminished pulses. Encourage these patients to dangle the legs. For PVD, um, peripheral vascular disease, the blood cannot get back up. These patients will have edema, brown venous stasis ulcers, and warm extremities. Teach the patient to elevate and wear their compression stockings. Big concern for PVD is a uh, VTE, venous thromboembolus. If this occurs, elevate the extremity and give a thrombolytic and heparin. Um, for um, Berger's disease, big risk factor is smoking. These patients will have lots of sores and claudication. Teach them to avoid cold and constriction. With Raynaud's, Raynaud's is more so triggered by cold stress. You'll see some blue and pale fingers treated with nifedipine. Hypertension is when we have a blood pressure that is one, greater than 140 over 90. Treatment is our ABCDs, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, clonidine, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. Also, a low salt diet will help. Decrease stress in smoking and increase exercise. Alrighty. Now this is more of our cardiac critical care portion. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Anything you get with these signs and symptoms, these if you have these assessment findings in a patient, they're going to be a priority concern. Okay. Especially cardiac tamp, aortic aneurysm, aortic dissection. Big, big, big priorities. So if you've got four patients and one of them is presenting with any of these signs and symptoms, they're going to be your priority and you're gonna to wanna to delegate your time towards these patients. What will we uh, see in a patient with cardiac tamponade? And they'll have pulses paradoxus and muffled heart sounds. Big key finding in cardiac tamp is Beck's triage. Triad, they will have muffled heart sounds, hypotension and jugular vein distension. Treatment is gonna be surgery. It's gonna be a cardiac window to help drain the fluid. Pericarditis, that is kind of swelling of, of that area. The patient's going to have some pleuritic pain and a friction rub. Treatment for this is going to be NSAIDs and colching. For the patient who is experiencing pain, have them sit up and lean forward. Infective endocarditis can occur post-infection. The patient will have a new, a new onset regurgitation murmur and then petechiae and red spots and arterial emboli kind of, kind of all over the body, specifically the chest. What's the treatment for this? So they're going to require long-term IV antibiotics, so they're going to need a pick line placed. Concern is systemic emboli. Aortic aneurysm, um, this occurs when the aorta bursts. If the patient has excruciating back pain and hypotension, this is a priority finding. Um, okay. What is our kind of goals for managing an aortic aneurysm? Preventing hypertension. Hypotension can cause it to burst. Um, and usually it's treated with a aortic aneurysm repair. Post-procedure, um, assess for scrotal and abdominal bleeding, um, edema, and groin pain. Aortic disse dissection. This patient will have tearing, tearing pain and unequal blood pressure in both arms. Again, priority is going to be preventing hypertension because we want to prevent that from bursting. And this will require surgical repair. And finally, we're going to talk about shock. So essentially, what is shock? Hypotension. Hypotension that can result in poor perfusion, which can lead to uh, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Lots of different types of shock. We're going to talk about them. So if someone is experiencing cardiogenic shock, um, and before I begin, any patient that is experiencing signs and symptoms of shock, they're all going to have pretty much the same findings. They're going to have tachycardia and tachypnea. 
Um, with hypotension, you'll start to see a drop in urinary output, maybe some ashy skin, altered level of consciousness. What do we do for a patient who is in shock? Um, Trendelenburg for hypotension, promote that blood flow to the brain. Make sure we're putting multiple large bore IVs in. We're giving them oxygen. And then we're going to first give fluids. Remember that. Give fluids first. Then we're going to give vasopressors like norepinephrine. Okay. So what is cardiogenic shock? This is a pump problem. Remember with cardiogenic shock, it's a pump problem. So giving them fluids is not a good idea. We can push them with fluids, but it's just gonna send them into overload because the heart's not going to be able to pump those fluids into systemic circulation to help boost up our blood pressure, okay? What are we gonna do for this? We're gonna give them inotropes, give them medications that help the heart contract. Hypovolemic shock occurs when the patient has a loss of uh, fluid volume. We're gonna replace the fluids, okay? Big, big priority. Also, why are they hypovolemic? Are they severely dehydrated? Or is there maybe some sort of internal bleed going on? What did they come in? Did they come in from a motor vehicle accident? Maybe we need to get a full CT, x-ray, anything we can in that moment. Neurogenic shock occurs um, in our patients with um, spinal cord injuries. Um, you'll start to see um, changes in heart rate and blood pressure. Treatment for this um, is going to be removing whatever stimulus is below the lesion. So that can be a kinked catheter, a wrinkled blanket, things like that. Anaphylactic or shock occurs from a severe allergic reaction. Priority is going to be epinephrine and Benadryl. Septic shock occurs from an infection. We must identify the source um, and then we treat with antibiotics, get a full pan culture. These patients also will require fluid and vasopressor. All right, friends, moving right along into our respiratory system. So some common tests um, that we use kind of in, in respiratory. First is going to be an ABG, arterial blood gas. This is always drawn from a radial artery. Um, if the patient is receiving supplemental oxygen, that's something you're going to want to document. Because it's also getting blood from an artery, we're going to need to apply lots of pressure afterwards. Man talks. this test for uh, tuberculosis, positive result is greater than 10. Um, a bronchoscopy, um, these patients need to be NPO eight hours beforehand. Afterwards, please monitor their respiratory status and report excessive bleeding. Thoracentesis can kind of help us uh, strain some fluid from the, the pleural cavity of the lung. Um, very important, we get a chest x-ray before and after. And while we're removing the fluid, we have the patient kind of sit up at the side of the bed um, and we remove no more than one liter, okay? Um, PEFR, this helps us get an idea of what medication a patient experiencing like asthma um, might need. Um, it's also good to measure before and after intervention. Alrighty, up next, we've got airway management. So first is gonna be oxygen delivery. Please make sure we prioritize safety, no fires, no any, nothing that can cause a fire. Um, there is nasopharyngeal airways where we kind of put in a tube through the nose, um, but this is contraindicated for patients with head trauma. Remember a Venturi mask is most precise for oxygen delivery. When you're putting your patient on a non-rebreather mask, make sure we crank the oxygen all the way up until we fully see the bag inflate. And then BiPAP masks can help with elevated carbon dioxide levels. When suctioning a patient, suctioning is always done as needed. When we're suctioning from a trach, make sure we put that patient in semi or high fowlers and hyperoxygenate before. Remember, we do for 10 to 15 seconds and we suction as we pull out. We're going to wait 30 seconds in between. So let's talk about some trach care. Again, keep that patient still in semi or high fowlers. At bedside, if your patient has a trach, we always want to keep two sizes at bedside, their current size and a size, you know, smaller, just in case it falls out. Again, we suction as needed. We do trach care every eight hours. And for the trach, we want to make sure that there's like one finger space between the neck and the ties. We don't want it to be too tight. For patient on mechanical ventilation, our priorities are going to be responding to alarms. 
Okay, we always we also want to make sure that the placement stays the same throughout the shift. So check what the centimeters are on the tube itself at the lips or teeth. So responding to alarms. If we hear a high pressure alarm, this means obstruction. Maybe the patient is bucking the vent. Maybe the patient has a lot of secretions. A concern when we hear that high obstruction is alarm is we could have a possible pneumothorax if that kind of obstruction continues. When we hear the low pressure alarm going off, there's some sort of disconnection. Make sure you check your tubing, but always assess your patient first. So now we get to talk about some respiratory disorders. So the thing with asthma is it can progress to status asthmaticus. So with asthma, it's always important that we stay with the patient and place them in high fowlers. We always give them their short acting beta, agon beta agonist first. Okay. The issue with this is it can progress. Um, if you start to see a patient with asthma using their accessory muscles and distended neck veins, this patient will require um, intubation. Okay. Um, carbon dioxide uh, toxicity can occur in patients. They will present with altered level of consciousness, increased respiratory rate. Um, increased blood pressure, and some cardiac dysrhythmias. The treatment for carbon dioxide toxicity, remember, this could be like our respiratory acidosis going on, okay? Um, how do we kind of help with that? BiPAP, possible ventilation, uh, uh, mechanical ventilation, okay? Tuberculosis is an infectious disease. These patients present with bloody sputum, low grade fever, and night sweats. It's important that we get a PBD test and then a sputum test to confirm. For patients with uh, suspected or confirmed tuberculosis, we always put them on airborne precautions. These patients will need to continue long-term antibiotics um, with the goal of getting three negative sputum cultures. Those are our ripe drugs, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazidamide, and ethambutol. We'll go more in detail about those medications and their side effects in pharmacology. Up next, we have pneumonia. These patients will experience um, tachypnea and tachycardia, um, diminished breath sounds, and you'll see some increased white blood cell count. It's very important that we get a chest x-ray. We'll see the pneumonia on the chest x-ray. Um, and we get a sputum culture to kind of rule out what's going on. These patients will require AV, IV antibiotics, and if it is severe enough, a possible thoracentesis. All righty. Up next, we have laryngeal cancer. Um, these patients will report kind of hoarseness of voice that's kind of unrelieved and some swollen lymph nodes. Our priority is going to be assessing the airway. These patients um, may require a laryngectomy. Afterwards, it's very important that we follow strict swallowing aspiration precautions, sitting them all the way up at the bed, um, teaching them how to safely swallow, giving them soft bite-sized foods at first, and then kind of Okay, did they tolerate that? Maybe we can move to minced moist, then we can, you know, kind of, kind of improve the diet, if you will. Um, for lung cancer treatment is going to be a possible lobectomy. If they do get a lobectomy, they're going to require a chest tube. What is COPD? It's a combination of um, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Um, emphysema, these patients will have a barrel chest with digital clubbing and respiratory acidosis. Essentially, those, those lungs are just not able to expand and deflate as much. It's basically as if you had a balloon that you've, you know, inflated and deflated, inflated and deflated, and it's just lost its, its stretchiness, okay? It's lost its recoil. Um, bronchitis, this is kind of swelling of the, of the bronchioles. Um, these patients will have lots of thick um, sputum and cough. What are our nursing interventions for COPD? Increased fluid and calories. It's going to take a lot of energy just for them to breathe. So we want to make sure that they stay um, up to par with their nutrition. Uh, sitting them up is going to help a lot as well and prevent infection. Okay, They already have a, a difficult time clearing those secretions and they have lots of secretions. They do get respiratory infection. Um, it can kind of cause a, a COPD exacerbation. Okay. Big complication of COPD is core pulmonale. This is right-sided heart failure. 
Now we talk about our respiratory emergencies. So what are our signs of a deteriorating respiratory status in a patient? Your patient experiences any of these findings that is going to be an absolute priority. So if they have an acidotic ABG, hypoxia, they have some paradoxical breathing, altered level of consciousness or an acute sense of panic, all of a sudden they feel like impending doom, they feel anxious, very, very anxious. Those are priority findings, okay? They often indicate something very severe. Pulmonary embolism, these patients will have um, hypotension, shortness of breath, tachypnea, tachycardia. Um, you'll hear a friction rub. And again, they're gonna have that sense of impending doom. We're gonna wanna get a stat chest X-ray and a D-dimer. We're gonna make sure that we place these patients in semi-thalers, give them supplemental O2, um, and this is going to require a thrombolytic and an anticoagulant. Essentially, it's the blood clot in the lungs. ARDS is our acute, uh, our acute respiratory distress syndrome. These patients have what we call refractory hypoxia, meaning no matter how much oxygen we give them, whether it's BiPAP, whether it's Venturi mask, it's not going to help because the little alveoli, the sites of gas exchange, are just not, not working properly. These patients, again, will have acute panic. Treatment is going to be identifying the underlying cause. In the meantime, we want to go ahead and uh, figure out, um, put them on ventilation, mechanical ventilation, while we go ahead and we treat the underlying cause. Up next, we have a fat emboli. These patients will have shortness of breath and petechiae. And then up next, we have a pleural effusion. Fluid collects in the pleural space. These patients will present with shortness of breath, pain on inspiration, and diminished lung sounds. Alrighty. Up next, we have our tension pneumothorax. These patients will have increased lung and cardiac pressure. Um, well, so that's the cause, my apologies. The cause of attention pneumothorax is increased lung and cardiac pressure. When we talked about ventilation earlier, that was kind of our, our concern with a, with a high pressure alarm. These patients will present with decreased cardiac output, decreased breath sounds, the trachea will deviate um, to the unaffected side, and you'll see one-sided chest expansion. The treatment for this is a chest tube. Up next, we have our pneumothorax. This is a collapsed lung. Again, trachea is going to deviate to the uninfected side. Treatment for this is going to be a chest tube. We talked about chest tube in our nursing fundamentals. Up next, we have pneumothorax. This occurs when blood essentially pools in the pleural space. You'll hear decreased sounds on the side in which the blood is pooling, OK? Treatment for this is going to be a thoracentesis or chest tube. So, chest tubes. Again, this is a little bit of a review from fundamentals. So when we are inserting a chest tube, we make sure that the patient is in semi-fowlers. Or if they're unable to be in semi-fowlers, we keep them laying flat. We give pain medications or sedation prior to the procedure. It can be done at bedside. For a removal of a chest tube, place them high up in semi-fowlers. Teach the patient to inhale and bear down as you remove. Afterwards, we cover with a sterile petroleum jelly gauze. What are some complications of chest tubes? Air leak. If we have an air leak, there will be continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber. If there is a kink in the tubing, we will no longer see titling in the water seal. If there is no bubbling in the suction control, check the tubes, okay? Maybe there's some sort of kink. Um, maybe they're unconnected, but, but check your tubing. If the chest tube gets disconnected from the um, little um, contraption, from the actual device, we're going to, but it's still, you know, in the patient, we're going to take that end, um, we're going to place, we're gonna cut, we're gonna place the end in sterile water. Okay, if the patient has pulled out their chest tube, we are going to cover the site with petroleum gauze and we're going to tape it down on three sides. If your patient has a chest tube, we never milk or clamp the tube. Make sure there's no loops in your tubing. Very important to review our suction control, water seal and collection chamber. In the suction control, we need continuous bubbling. 
if there's intermittent bubbling going on, it just means we need to add more pressure, suction pressure. For our water seal, we want tidaling. Intermittent bubbles are okay, but continuous bubbling is not okay. This can indicate an air leak. In our collection chamber, again, we want no bubbling. Um, and we're gonna report drainage greater than 100 mLs an hour. All right, friends, up next, we've got GI and nutrition, lots of common tests, um, stool samples, fecal occult, um, urea breath test, this test for H. pylori, with this, we have the patient exhale CO2 in a bag, then they drink a uh, urea drink, and then exhale again. If the carbon dioxide is less than um, what it was prior to, it means the patient has an H. pylori infection. Okay. The hydrogen breath test, um, this helps us see if the patient maybe has some sort of bacterial infection going on. Um, essentially, they eat sugar and exhale. If the hydrogen is elevated, that means the patient has a bacterial infection. Endoscopies give us a good look on what's going on inside the bowels. Make sure the patient is on clear liquid prior to, and we keep them NPO with water only for eight hours before. Afterwards, our priority assessment findings are gonna be assessing for bleeds. EGD. Make sure we keep the patient um, NPO prior to. Again, our priority is going to be any bleeds or perforation. Why? Because it's going to bleed um, kind of into the, the, the trachea. It's going to bleed into the throat. That can cause an airway issue. Okay. Um, do, do, do. Again, colonoscopy, a lot of it's going to be bowel prep. Barium swallow study helps us um, see really what is going on on the inside of the patient swallowing. Maybe you have a patient that's frequently aspirating. Maybe you have a patient that had a stroke and has difficulty swallowing. The barium swallow study helps us know what's going on. However, barium, uh, we don't want it to stay in the body very long. So after the barium swallow study, increase your fluids, fibers, and laxatives to help promote excretion. Yes, those stools might be looking a little bit white for the first few days after that's normal, okay? Liver biopsy afterwards, um, make sure that the patient lays on that affected side if they took it um, to help prevent bleeding. If we kind of lay on that affected side, we're applying pressure, organs are shifting, applying pressure, help and prevent bleeds. Post-liver biopsy priorities are going to be assessing for hypotension that can indicate a bleed. Um, and then we have paracentesis. This can kind of help drain some fluid from the abdominal or peritoneal cavity. No need to keep the menkeo prior. Some therapeutic procedures involve nutrition. We've got our NG tube. Always make sure that the patient's head of bed is elevated when receiving. Always check the pH before feeds and every six hours, we want the goal pH between three and five. That's the good pH of the stomach. Always flush with normal saline before and after meals. Um, we check residual prior to feeds. Big complication um, of NG tubes is refeeding syndrome. This causes a dangerous fluid and electrolyte shift, hypertension, fatigue, weakness, confusion, dyspnea, and edema. So how can we give a patient nutrition if they're unable to have, you know, oral, oral intake, or maybe they're severely malnourished? First, um, more kind of for long term, we have a PEG tube. We can also do an NG tube in the short term. Okay, this is overall safer. Um, parenteral nutrition is done through a PIC line. Um, the TPN must be given through a central vein. Okay. This will then require aseptic dressing changes. When a patient is on parenteral nutrition, it is custom to them. Um, you're gonna get a big bag of their TPN. You must change that tubing every 24 hours. If you need to hang a wee bag, we're gonna redo the tubing, okay? In the event um, TPN is running late, you don't have it, um, keep a bag of D10 at bedside. Again, big complication, refeeding syndrome. Um, dangerous, dangerous fluid and electrolyte imbalances. These patients will have hypotension, confusion, and some impaired organ function. Another complication of parenteral nutrition is hyperglycemia. 
These patients will have nausea, abdominal pain, and excessive thirst. An additional complication would be fat overload. The issue with fat overload is it can progress to multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Patient will present with fever, clotting abnormalities, and increased triglycerides. What are some surgical procedures we've got going on? First is going to be our bariatric surgery. Again, these patients must have a BMI over 40 or over 35 with comorbidities. Post-procedure, educate on the importance of splinting coughs with a pillow, wearing their abdominal binder, um, ambulating, and assessing the airway. After surgery, these patients will be on a liquid diet. Big complication post-bariatric surgery is dumping syndrome. These patients will progress with tachycardia, nausea, diarrhea, cramps, and diaphoresis. How can we prevent dumping syndrome? We want to reduce um, carbs in the diet, avoid simple carbs in the diet. Instead, increase proteins and fats. We can also have them lie flat after eating to help slow down transit time. A complication um, after surgery can be a leak. This will require surgical repair. The patient might complain of back pain, um, tachycardia. They'll be pretty restless and have poor urinary output. Colostomy. Um, these patients, it's important to teach them to avoid nuts, popcorn seeds, etc. High fiber foods are not optimal for patient with colostomy. Um, when do we change the colostomy, or sorry, we empty the colostomy. When it's about a quarter to half full, we change it every three to seven days. Some oral esophageal order disorders. First, we have dental caries. These are your cavities. Um, prioritize checkups and um, oral care. Reflux. Um, it's good to teach these patients to consume four to six small meals per day and really keep the head of bed elevated after meals. What can we give for patients? Um, antacids, H2 blockers, um, proton pump inhibitors, but for short-term use. Hiatal hernia, these patients have regurgitation and just have an overall feeling of just, you know, chest discomfort and feeling suffocated after eating. We're going to get a barium swallow study. So again, we have a good picture of what's going on. Big concern for anal hernias is bear, it puts them at risk for Barrett's esophagus. Patients with hiatal hernia might require a fundification surgery. So now we get to talk about our pancreatic disorders. First is going to be pancreatitis. This patient complains of severe left upper quadrant pain. We also have pain after eating or when lying down. You'll see both Turner and Colin signs. Colin signs is when they kind of have bruising on that, that left side of the abdomen. Okay. Pancreatic cancer. Um, these patients often require a Whipple procedure where essentially they remove the head of the pancreas. Okay. This means though that they might require some long-term insulin because remember pancreas uh, secretes, you know, helps, helps produce insulin. Okay. All right. Up next, we have peptic ulcer disease. With peptic ulcer disease, these patients have um, essentially like, um, like gas, acid, just reflux that's relieved with food. Um, peptic ulcer disease can often be caused by an H. pylori infection. The treatment for peptic ulcer disease, if it's caused by an H. pylori infection, is going to be two antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor. Also, just overall teach them to re reduce foods that exacerbate their symptoms. Irritable bowel syndrome is um, occurs when a patient has, you know, episodes of diarrhea, episodes of constipation, abdominal pain. Really, we kind of symptom manage for diarrhea. We're going to avoid hot drinks. If the patients had diarrhea longer than two days, they want to report that because it, they're going to have some maybe dehydration, fluid, electrolyte imbalances. For constipation, teach these patients to avoid milk and just follow good bowel prep with stool softeners, increase in fluid fiber fruits. Abdominal hernias, you'll see an out pouching lump in the abdomen. A concern is strangulation. These patients will have pain and decrease. Um, bowel sounds on auscultation. If they have a repair, it's important afterwards that they avoid heavy lifting and they split their coughs and deep breathing. Peritonitis, these patients will have a rigid board-like abdomen, rebound tenderness, nausea, vomiting, 
treatment for peritonitis um, is going to be a nasogastric tube for decompression and IV antibiotics. GI bleed, the symptoms of um, what these symptoms are depend on where the bleed is. If it's an upper GI bleed, they'll have, you know, um, some maybe coffee ground emesis. They will have, you know, bloody emesis bloody sputum. If it's a lower GI bleed, you'll see bloody tarry stools. Big risk factor for GI bleeds are going to be NSAIDs, H. pylori infection. Um, same thing with our abdominal destruction, obstructions. These symptoms depend on where this obstruction is located. If it's in the small bowel, they'll start to have some colicky pain, vomiting, uh, pain that comes and goes, but if it's in the large intestine, they'll have more of a constant pain and they'll have lots and lots of distension. Again, the treatment is going to be keeping them NPO with an NG tube to decompress. We're going to avoid laxatives in this situation because there's an obstruction. Up next, we have diverticulosis versus diverticulitis. Diverticulosis is our um, intestinal out pouches. Um, good thing to do for these patients is to increase fiber. Diverticulitis is when we have more of the inflammation of said out pouches. These patients will experience diarrhea and constipation. During this exacerbation, we're going to want to avoid high fiber and high roughage foods. Clear liquid diet is preferred. Irritable bowel disease, you can have Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. With Crohn's disease, they have inflammation anywhere in the GI tract. Um, treatment for Crohn's is going to be resting the GI tract and giving immunosuppressants. Ulcerative colitis is when we have continuous ulcers on the GI tract. Therefore, they can have bloody stools. Um, treatment for this is going to be keeping them NPO during these acute exacerbations. Up next, we have um, our hepatic disorders. Um, we have hepatitis, we have hepatitis A, B, C, and non-viral. Um, I don't think it's super pertinent to know like um, the nitty gritty details about hepatitis um, A, B, C, but just know usually it's transmitted via oral, um, via blood, or via sex, and it can damage the liver, okay? It can... A lead to cirrhosis. So in the early stages of cirrhosis, the patient will start to have maybe some jaundice and weight loss. And then in our late stages, maybe some pruritus of the skin. And when we're end stage, they can have hepatic encephalopathy, which is essentially when ammonia builds up and the patient presents with altered mental status, lethargy. Um, for cirrhosis, have these patients, you know, increased calories, um, for the hepatic encephalopathy, give lactulose. We really want to help get that ammonia out. It's going to help them basically have diarrhea that will help, you know, get, get that out. Okay. All righty. Up next, we have some gallbladder diseases, cholithiasis is stones, cholecystitis is inflammation. A patient with cholecystitis will have lots of pain after eating high fat foods. Treatment we can give them is promethazine. And we're going to want to keep them NPO. Other common GI disorders we've got, um, we've got appendicitis. Again, these patients have right lower quadrant pain at McBurney's point. Um, keep them NPO and start them on some normal saline. We're going to want to avoid pain medications because we want to be able to assess if they've had a perforation or not. Celiac, this is a gluten um, intolerance. These patients simply can't process gluten. So treatment, going to be avoiding gluten. Big thing with celiac, those, these patients are at risk for certain cancers and iron deficiency. Um, toxic megacolon is absolutely an emergency finding. Um, we're going to assess for signs and symptoms of shock. They will have fever, bloody diarrhea, and very big abdominal distension. For esophageal varices, we must keep these patients MPO. Um, we're going to also want to avoid NGTs, nasogastric tubes. Concern is going to be bleeds and hypovolemia. Post-op ileus can occur um, after any sort of procedure. Things like pain medication anesthesia generally slows down tummy transit time. Um, 
these patients will need to be put on a clear liquid diet. Evisceration occurs post can occur post abdominal surgery, um, where essentially they split from their surgical site and now there their organs are are out. What do we do? We cover with sterile gauze and saline. All right. Now we're gonna go ahead and do a little bit of an intro to nutrition. Again, this is a good kind of overview. Um, again, just know we want to prioritize proteins, prioritize water intake, um, prioritize fiber. So what are fat soluble uh, vitamin rich foods? Vitamin A, foods that've got liver, dairy, leafy greens, vitamin D can be found in fish oil and milk and obviously sun. Vitamin K, um, yolk, liver, cheese, leafy greens. These are fat-soluble vitamins. Our water-soluble uh, vitamins, we've got vitamin C. So they're going to be found in uh, citrus fruits, tomatoes, and broccoli. Folic acid, uh, very important for um, prenatal um, care. We've got leafy greens, eggs, and liver. Vitamin B12 uh, is found in foods um, such as liver, kidneys, and meats. So what are modified diets and why might a patient be on a modified diet? First, it's going to be clear liquid. Um, it must be a liquid at room temperature, meaning um, it can't be like pudding. That's not clear liquid. Okay. This is used for short-term patients, usually post-op patients um, or patients that just simply need to rest their GI tract. Full liquids can be clear or milky, like protein shakes. They can also have strained fruit and vegetables. Usually a patient who is on a clear liquid diet will progress to a full liquid diet. Then we can progress to pureed. Then we can, you know, progress to, to other diets, okay? Um, pureed foods, these are usually used for patients with difficulty swallowing or dysphagia. Maybe our stroke patients. Mechanical soft can also be used for stroke patients. Um, just making sure no raw fruits, vegetables, raisins, or seeds. And then our soft, bland, low fiber. This is non-irritating to the GI tract. So this was chronic GI issues that um, need to, you know, rest their, their gut. Um, that's going to be what type of diet they're on. Essentially, it's very smooth and creamy foods. What diets do we have for patients with alterations in metabolism? For patients with PKU, they have an impaired protein metabolism. Therefore, we're going to avoid high protein foods. For patients with galactosemia, they have an issue with carbohydrate metabolism. Therefore, we're going to avoid simple sugars and lactose. Patients with lactose intolerance, they lack the enzyme lactase to break it down. So they can still have lactose foods, but they must take a lactase pill. Remember, not all dairy contains lactose, so hard cheeses and Greek yogurt are okay. Modified fats are given for patients with a lot of sort of malabsorption issues. Um, essentially, you avoid whole fat or whole milk, fatty meats, but more of our lean meats like eggs, um, maybe like turkey, those are all fine. And then vegan diet um, avoids animal products. A big concern for the vegan diet is a vitamin B12 deficiency, so they might need to take supplements. All righty. Now we're going to talk about foods that contain high amounts of these um, things. So cholesterol, a low cholesterol diet is used for patients with hyperlipidemia or cardiovascular disease. Um, high cholesterol foods, animal products. Low cholesterol foods is gonna be our shellfish, lean meats, fruits and vegetables. What are our high potassium foods? Remember patients with um, end stage renal disease will need to be on like low potassium, low sodium diets. Same thing with heart failure. So our high potassium foods are going to be bananas, oranges, spinach, apricots. Low potassium foods is going to be like our bread, our cereal, berries. Low sodium diet, diets are used uh, for patients with hypertension, heart failure, myocardial infarction, preeclampsia, um, or ascites. Um, what are high sodium foods? Anything canned, essentially. What are our iron-rich foods? Um, these are going to be um, organ meats, enriched cereals, dried foods. Avoid giving iron supplements with food. Take iron supplements on an empty stomach. Also, vitamin C um, helps improve 
iron absorption. So absolutely pair some some fish uh, with with maybe some orange slices. Okay. And then high calcium foods are going to be our milk and dark greens. Um, with calcium, vitamin D helps to aid in calcium absorption. So that is all for GI, GU, and nutrition. I know it was a lot. We're going to wrap things up with endocrine nursing. So first thing we're going to talk about is disorders of our pituitary gland. So disorders of the anterior pituitary gland, we can have some acromegaly. Essentially, um, they have too much growth hormone after puberty. Um, most of our, our, you know, treatment for, for these is going to maybe be a, um, some sort of surgical removal of, of the gland. Gigantism occurs when the patient has this increase in growth hormone before, or before puberty. What is causing these growth hormone imbalances? Usually maybe some sort of tumor on the anterior pituitary or an issue with the anterior pituitary itself. Dwarfism occurs when there is uh, not enough growth hormone being secreted. We want to make sure we get an MRI on these patients, making sure we're not ass we're assessing for any sort of um, brain um, complication. Treatment is going to be supplemental growth hormone therapy. What are some of our disorders of the posterior pituitary? Um, remember, posterior pituitary helps us secrete ADH. So first one is going to be diabetes insipidus. This is when we're not producing enough ADH. This causes mass amounts of dilute urine. Okay, this patient will require um, treatment with desmopressin and daily waves. Okay, SIADH on the other hand is when we have too much ADH that causes water retention. So they will have very little concentrated urine. They will also have hyponatremia and low osmolality. Patients will present with fluid volume overload. Treatment is going to be um, hypertonic saline and dema, um, demaclocycline and conobactam. What are our disorders of the adrenal gland versus going to be our adrenal cortex helps us uh, secreting ACTH. Um, first up is Addison's. This is when we don't have enough secretion of cortisol and ACTH. This can be caused by abruptly stopping steroids or maybe a, a tumor issue with the adrenal cortex itself. These patients can have bright bronze skin, hypotension, hypoglycemia, nausea, and vomiting. What will our labs look like? These patients might have some bronze skin. I'm oh, sorry, our labs. These patients might have some hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypercalcemia. Treatment is going to be steroids, uh, sodium. Concern is going to be our Addisonian crisis. This is shock from stress. This patient will have severe hypotension. Treatment for this is hydrocortisone. Cushing's is an over-secretion of glucocorticoids. This is caused by too much steroid use, too much chronic steroid use. These patients present with obesity, um, moon face, buffalo hump, and hyperglycemia. Um, this is diagnosed via the dexamethasone suppression test. Treatment is going to be either um, kind of stopping the steroids or an adrenalectomy. The issue with Cushing's is we have lots of sugar building up. This puts these patients at risk for osteoporosis and impairs their um, immune um, system. Okay. Up next, we have hyperaldosteronism. This is when we have too much aldosterone being produced. These patients will have hyper, hypokalemia, hypernatremia, and alkalosis. This results in hypertension. The treatment for this is going to be spironolactone and blood pressure management. Why spironolactone? It's a potassium sparing diuretic. These patients have hypokalemia, so we want to help get some fluid off, but we don't want to waste all that potassium. What are our adrenals of the our um, disorders of the adrenal medulla? We have our bio um, cytochroma. Essentially, this makes the body produce excessive catecholamines, um, meaning epinephrine, norepinephrine. This is diagnosed by a 24-hour urine test. These patients will have high blood pressure, headache, sweating, increased metabolism, just feel really ramped up. Treatment for this is going to be propanolol. Um, and then we're going to need to remove that tumor. We avoid palpating the abdomen for a patient with BO cytochroma simply because the more we palpate it, the more cholamines end up getting released, essentially.
All righty. Up next, we have disorders of the thyroid. We've got hypothyroidism versus hyperthyroidism. Remember, our thyroid hormone gives us energy. So if we have hypothyroidism, we don't have enough uh, energy. These patients will have weakness, fatigue, and lethargy. Low T3 and T4. Treatment for this is going to be levothyroxine. Make sure we take that on an empty stomach. Big complication of hypothyroidism is what we call a mixed edema coma. These patients essentially have so little energy, it leads to decreased cardiac output and decreased respiratory rate. If they have respiratory depression and are hypoxic, they will require intubation. Up next, we have hyperthyroidism. We got too much T3, T4. We have too much energy. So these patients are going to be sped up, ramped up. They're going to have increased heart rate, weight loss. You'll start to see some exophthalmos, okay? Treatment for this is going to be um, PTU medication, radioactive iodides. Remember, follow safety precautions, meaning these patients are in a room by themselves. We're using, um, after they use the bathroom, they're flushing the toilet multiple times. You're limiting your exposure around them, et cetera. Okay, what can we also do um, for the exophthalmos? We can tape down the eyelids to help them sleep and use artificial tears. Big complication of hyperthyroidism is thyroid storm. They'll have tachycardia, fever, hypertension, and altered mental status. This might result in the patient getting a thyroidectomy. The concern for this is it can cause thyroid toxicosis after surgery. They will have fever, chills, and tachycardia, which can progress to VTAC. Okay, what we're going to do after a thyroidectomy, we're going to assess for tingling and um, tetany. This means hypocalcemia. Therefore, we give calcium gluconate. Post procedures, we absolutely assess for strider or hoarseness, keep them in semifollers. If they're experiencing difficulty breathing or strider post thyroidectomy, that's absolutely a priority concern. Now we get to talk about disorders of the parathyroid. So um, if someone has decreased parathyroid, um, it's usually caused by decreased calcium. Sorry, no. If someone has hypoparathyroidism, essentially their parathyroid hormone is not secreting enough calcium. Okay. What will these patients present with? Hypocalcemia. So those signs and symptoms, you're going to have tetany, paresthesias, the Chauvet sign, that's a twitch when you stroke your cheek. And Trousseau sign, when you inflate the blood pressure cuff, their hand will kind of kind of flip up. Um, absolutely assess the EKG. Um, calcium imbalances can cause, cause uh, EKG changes. Treatment is going to be vitamin D and calcium gluconate. And we're also going to want to encourage the patient to increase calcium and vitamin D in their diet with tofu, bananas, almonds, leafy greens, sardines, and tuna. Um, next, we have hyperparathyroidism. I always like to say like parathyroid hormone puts calcium into the body. So increased parathyroid hormone will cause increased calcium. But where is this increased calcium coming from? Essentially, the body is going to pull calcium from the bones so it can go into systemic circulation. Therefore, the patient's bones will become weak and brittle, leading to osteoporosis. Treatment for hyperparathyroidism, we've got dialysis, Lasix, calcium emetic, something to help mimic calcium, and then surgical remover, removal of the parathyroid. All right, now we get to talk about disorders of the pancreas. These are going to be our type 1, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes. These patients do not produce any insulin, um, therefore they require insulin. They will present with polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, and weight loss. Type 2 diabetes occurs usually from risk factors. It is insulin resistance. They still produce insulin. It just doesn't affect the body. Um, these risk factors include improper diet, lack of exercise. Big complications are our neuropathy, nephropathy, increased BUN, and increased creatinine. Metabolic syndrome, these patients have kind of like a triad. They have abdominal obesity, they have hyperglycemia, they've got hypertension, increased uh, cholesterol panels, et cetera. 
Remember, HbA1c gives us a better overall picture of um, glucose management, sugar management, normal blood sugar levels, usually fasting 70 to 110, hypoglycemia is when we're less than 70, hyperglycemia or over 200. But these are just kind of um, the AccuCheck's give us what is the body's current sugar right now. Lots of things can cause sugar to go up. Maybe the patient just ate a meal. Maybe they're on steroids. So our HbA1c, we used to give us a good picture of, okay, is this diabetes? How well kind of on a on a longer scale is, is this patient's sugar being managed? Um, up next, we have hypoglycemia versus hyperglycemia. Remember, hypoglycemia is less than 60. These patients will present with diaphoresis, tachycardia, blurry vision, weakness, headache, and confusion. Treatment for this, we're going to want to give them 15 grams of carbohydrates. If they're unable to swallow a carbohydrate, we're going to give IM glucagon. Essentially, what we do is we follow the rule of threes. We give uh, 15 grams every 15 minutes. We can do it three times. Okay. Up next, we have hyperglycemia. These patients will present with um, they'll feel very, very hot. They'll have very dry skin. They'll be very irritable. Treatment for hyperglycemia is going to be insulin. We've got two kind of different um, things going on with hyperglycemia. First is going to be our diabetic ketoacidosis. These patients' blood sugar can range between 300 and 800. Additionally, these patients will have metabolic acidosis and ketones in the urine. Signs and symptoms will be fruity breath, small respirations, and a weak rapid pulse. Treatment. First thing we do, rehydrate, give them IV fluids. We then want to slowly lower the blood glucose with IV regular insulin. Remember, regular insulin is the only insulin that can go in an IV. Once we get that blood glucose down to 200, we're still going to want to um, treat, but now we're going to start giving them some IV dextrose because we don't want to drop it too much. If the patient's hypokalemic, this can happen with hyperglycemia, we give potassium. DKA uh, occurs in patients with type 1 diabetes where they produce no insulin. Um, HHS is our um, hyperosmolar um, hyperglycemia. These patients have blood glucose anywhere greater than 600. The um, sugar is very, very, very high. And our priority concern is this will cause massive dehydration. Okay. However, this doesn't cause ketones or any, you know, shifts in, in, in acid because this patient still produce insulin, just simply not enough. So usually this occurs more so with our type two diabetics. We're going to treat with fluid and electrolyte replacement and IV insulin. Assess for altered mental status. Alrighty. Last but not least, we are going to go over some, um, education points for a patient with diabetes. First thing is gonna be our diabetic foot care. Make sure that we tell these patients to um, clean and dry their feet daily. Wearing shoes is super important. They shouldn't be walking around barefoot. They have limited feeling in their feet. So they won't be able to know, maybe they stub their toe. Maybe they stepped on something they shouldn't have. Have them trim their toenails and keep them straight. If they have any overlapping toes, use cotton to separate. Avoid putting cream in between the toes. What is a good uh, diet for patients with type 2 diabetes? We decrease fat and carbs and we increase fiber, okay? Avoid potatoes that has the highest amount of um, sugar. What is our diabetic sick day education? If your patient with diabetes is sick, we want to make sure that we're still continuing to check blood sugar and we're also going to want to check the urine for ketones every three hours. If it's elevated or if there's ketones in the urine, have the patient call the doctor. It's very important that they uh, have adequate fluid intake and eat small, frequent meals. Tell them to continue to take their insulin if it's within their parameters. All right, my friends, that is all I have for the review today. I hope this was helpful. As always, if you need anything, please go ahead and let me know um, and check out the link for um, the uh, copy for this review. So thank you so much, and I will see you for uh, Med Surge Part 3 of 3.